Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Fired Up with CJ show. Today, we're going to be learning about Hasidism, and we have uh, Nathaniel Miles Yepes here, who is talking about a book that he co-authored, A Heart of Fire. Can you see it? <laughs> so welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to um, talk to you a little bit about this book, and, and um, there are whole, first of all, I don't know anything about Hasidism. I can't even pronounce it, Hasidism. <laughs> and um, it. yeah, so I, I wanted to know a little bit about what prompted you to write this book. And there's this idea in, when I was reading through the book of Neo Hasidism, which I don't even know what that is. So I thought we could talk about Hasidism and the Neo Hasidism and what the differences are. And that it seems like there's this opportunity and it talks about three turnings. And I don't know any about this. So could you actually educate myself and the audience? Yeah, well, Hasidism is a um, a Jewish mystical tradition which arose in the 18th century in Eastern Europe, and it's a movement that is a popular movement that was born out of the Kabbalah. Mm. The Kabbalah is the Jewish mystical tradition, uh, but that was uh, mostly for an elite group of you know uh, scholarly people who were practicing a you know, very rarefied form of, of Jewish mystical practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, a man uh, in Eastern Europe who, who was called the Baal Shem Tov, the master of the good name, God's name, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. took uh, the ideas of Kabbalah and made of them a popular movement that could be taught to everyone. Mm -hmm. and, and that popular movement really took off so that you know, by the mid 20th century, you know, most of Eastern Europe that was Jewish were Hasidic mm. and bound to this movement. And Neo Hasidism is to distinguish uh, those of us uh, who are uh, see ourselves as revitalizing this tradition, see it in a new light. It's not uh, just a uh, not just um, um, those, you know, who are identified with Hasidism, meaning long beards and side curls and black hats and black coats, but taking the spirit of Hasidism and applying it, applying it in our daily lives today in modernity. Hmm. And what is that spirit of Hasidism that you want to apply to? Like, what can you give me some examples of what that means? Well. I'll tell you, the, the first line I ever read about Hasidism was, a, was in a book by Martin Buber, who was a great Jewish philosopher and scholar of Hasidism. And the first line I ever read was, it began with a Hebrew word, hit lahavut. It said, hit lahavut is the burning, the ardor of ecstasy. Hmm. Hit lahavut is the burning, the ardor of ecstasy. So that's a translation of that word. From the moment I read that line, I was in. <laughs> because he was trying to characterize Hasidism. It's about uh, a great investment of one's being and body, you know, mm -hmm. the entirety of one's soul into a moment. Mm. You know, it's the yeah. burning. You know, to, to burn in life, to be, you know, filled with its richness and live mm. deep. Mm. It's not great so that, that even that word is actually... That word activated that desire within you. It's not yes. fascinating. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. So so those ideas characterize Hasidism. Also the word kavana, which means intentionality or investment. So how deeply do you invest in any given moment, in any given activity? And this characterizes Hasidic teachings, like mm. overwhelmingly mm. powerful investment in everything that you do. Mm -hmm. and connecting those activities to the divine. Mm -hmm. And that's a characteristic of Judaism anyways. Mm -hmm. Judaism is called, you know, often it's thought of as a religion of commandments. Mm -hmm. But the word commandment in Hebrew is mitzvot. And mitzvot has a root which suggests connection. So they're not really commandments, they're God connections. Every commandment that's given in the Bible is an opportunity to connect with God through 
daily activities, the blessing that we say over food, we, even the blessing we say after going to the bathroom. These are all to connect the mundane to the spiritual hmm. and then sanctify all of life. Hmm. Okay, so what do you say when you go to the bathroom that I don't? <laughs> Give me an example. <laughs> that captivated my interest. <laughs> you go to the bathroom well, like three times a day at least, so what What should we be doing differently to be to have that be more <laughs> spiritual? It's, it's, it's basically a blessing of gratitude for allowing everything to work. <laughs> okay. So when you go to the and bathroom, once... you say, what do you say when you're in the bathroom? So you... <laughs> Go out of the bathroom, and what is this Hebrew saying that you say? It's a long prayer. <laughs> you say a prayer after you go to the bathroom each time? That's devotion. That is devotion. Okay. You started down this path. I know your face is all red, and you're like, how did we get here? You took me down this path. I know. I didn't expect you to take hold of it. <laughs> Okay, I'll 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 I'll, 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 um, so I'll drag Boulder, us out. So I have a mild sun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, but it's about living an intentional life, and all, what I love about what you just said is taking mundane. So at the root of everything is to live life very intentionally, and in that everything that we do, whether it's go to the bathroom, eat, anything that we are doing every day is a sacred act, and so the traditions and things that. Um, and, and, and with neo-Hasidism, is it new or neo because some of those aspects, it's kind of refreshing some of those aspects that people have lost sight of? Or why, the, why does it have to, why does neo-Hasidism need to even exist? Um, because uh, Hasidism started out in the 18th century, as I mentioned, as a very radical movement. Mm. Uh, radical in, in, in its inclusivity and in making uh, mystical teachings applicable and uh, available to common people. Um, and over time, uh, Hasidism became a movement that became highly uh, identified with orthodoxy and stringency. Mm. Um, and there are good reasons for that, but the idea of neo-Hasidism is to open it back up mm. uh, so that it's not fully identified with the most stringent orthodoxy, um, so that it is again available to the common people. Uh, and those common people today are different than the common people of the past. Mm -hmm. Now they're Jews and non-Jews and uh, people who are maybe not poor and uneducated, maybe highly educated, but have fallen away from the tradition. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it's to make the best of Jewish mystical teaching available to, to everyone again. Mm -hmm. So there are people who talk about the cabal and I, I, am I pronouncing it correct? Ka, the cabal? It, 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 that word comes from it. Kabbalah. Kabbalah. Okay. So they're talking yeah. about the Kabbalah and, uh, and are they really, is what they're talking about with the Kabbalah the same as the citizenism or, or is it different? Um, there are some differences. Uh, the teachings of the Kabbalah are a vast body of Jewish mystical teachings. That some are very ancient, and Hasidism incorporates those teachings, but perhaps not all of them. Uh, so, there, Hasidism is a mystical tradition, but it's not all of the Kabbalah. Mm. So, okay. a person can be a Kabbalist, you know, and see themselves learning the Jewish mystical teachings but not be associated with Hasidism. Ah, uh, okay, got it, because it's a superset of, of um, Hasidism. Okay, got it. And so so I want to talk about your, so you heard this, tell me the phrase, like the word again that was about um, the fire. Yeah, Hitler Havut is the burning, the ardor of ecstasy, as how Martin Buber put it. Burning of ecstasy. Okay, this is what captivated your attention. Yeah, ardor and of ecstasy. Ardor of ecstasy. Okay, God. So you're like, okay, I want some of that. Um, 
(laughs) (laughs) So that, let's talk about your own personal journey. So you heard that, you thought, well, that sounds pretty good. And then you learned about um, the uh, 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 investment and being clear with our intentions and to make spirituality part of our daily life. So tell me a little bit about your path. You heard that word. Were you um, uh, um, in Hasidism at that time or, or not? No, um, at that time, I was, I was just learning that I was Jewish. Oh, wow. I, yeah, I'm uh, from one of those families that are called crypto-Jewish, uh, yeah. Jewish families from Spain that were forced to convert during the Inquisition. Wow, okay. And so my family, um, you know, in that, that period, forced to convert, hid their Jewish identity, but they tried to maintain it in secret. And so for some 500 years, my family maintained some semblance of Jewish identity, passing that to one or maybe two members of the family a generation. Wow. And, and so I didn't learn it until I was about 17. Wow. And so when I read this book, I was, just, I was just investigating Judaism. I was just trying to find out all that I could. Wow. So you're learning about Judaism generally, and you came across this book. Is that because the... Uh, teachings that your family were sharing with you was it based on Hasidism or something different it's just Jewish just general Jewish stuff no well they barely knew anything they barely knew anything about being Jewish just that we were Jewish but when I heard it was such a a captivating moment Mm -hmm. you know when I learned that it was as if I'd already known that somehow Mm -hmm. and it just spun me in the direction of trying to learn everything I could uh so, so I'm actually from Southern Jewish roots, meaning um, the Jews of Spain were quite a different group than the Jews of Eastern Europe. Mm-hmm. So Hasidism is an Eastern European tradition. Oh. So it's, 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 it's odd that I started to learn about that. But right, because based on your actual <laughs> lineage, it wouldn't have been probably, it's, it would probably be, it's more Eastern European versus Spain. Interesting. But the, but the Kabbalah itself was born in Spain. Oh, it was. I didn't know yes. that. Yes, you know the oh. most of the teachings we have of the Kabbalah really they have their origin in Spain. Yeah. With, with that group of Jews. Yeah. Okay. So, how did your life take course after reading that book? You 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 learned about the ardor of ecstasy and all the traditions that were part of living a Hasidic life. Um, what happened to your life afterwards? Um, I think at that point. At the point when I learned that I was Jewish, I was actually uh, thinking of going into a Christian seminary. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, so it steered me in another direction. Um, I actually started to study comparative religion, and that's what I studied in college, and, and, and that's my specialty now. I'm a, uh, a comparative religion professor at Naropa University, which is actually a Buddhist-inspired university. Here in Boulder. Wow. So it, it actually spun me in a direction of learning about all religions. Oh, um, and then personally trying to learn as much as I could about being Jewish. Mm. So, uh, so one of the questions that um, I, I think modern spiritual people struggle with is, do you pick one path? Right. Do you focus on the Hasidism path or the Buddhist path? And, you know, you're a comparative literature, per, comparative uh, religion professor. So I'm sure that became very kind of interesting and tempting to go down many paths. How did you decide to go down the Hasidic path? I mean, I know that that was part of your, uh, you know, a little bit about what you were learning when you were younger and perhaps part of your, your roots. But what made you decide to go down that path, having studied all these other religions? Um, well, I don't know that I went down it exclusively. Um, I, I definitely didn't. Um, and, and I think, uh, while we can choose a tradition these days, and there's certainly a strength to that, <clears throat> it's not, I, I think, what characterizes modernity to choose one path. We're living in a time and in a culture, at least we are, we were having this conversation, or living in a culture where the exposure to multiple traditions is is, is unavoidable. Mm-hmm. 
our traditions are bumping into one another. We work in, you know, in cubicles next to people of radically mm. different cultures. Mm -hmm. And it's not a time where we're not going to be influenced. We are going to be influenced mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and everything is available on a Barnes & Noble bookshelf. Right. The Bhagavad Gita is going to be sitting right next to Shanti Deva, which is going to be right next to, you know, a book on Kabbalah, which is going to be next to a book of Rumi. Um, and and I think that that's beautiful. The the only real weakness is that we can get a, addicted to oral stage religion, which is whatever tastes good. Mm -hmm. And and so we eat a bunch of candy until we lose the taste for it, and then we just try to reproduce it somewhere else. Ah, so you're never deepening, getting past the threshold that you need to get to right. the depth of whatever that religion has to offer. That's interesting. But, huh. but we can't avoid the influence these days. And I'm certainly a person that represents what I like to call hyphenated spirituality. Yeah. Everybody today has a hyphen. Right. Whether you're a psychotherapist who does yoga or, you know, is a, a, a Christian Zen uh, Roshi, you know, which we have now. And... Yeah, right. <laughs> Right. So that's interesting. So um, how far down the path have you taken up with Hasidism? I mean, it sounds like you're, you know, you're saying a prayer after you go to the bathroom every day, like several <laughs> times, like that's heavy duty. So how I never should have mentioned that I, I, you never should have. So what? So <laughs> sorry. So so tell me a little bit about how how you chose how what things you decided to embrace and not of of the neo Hasidism movement. Well, I would say I, I started out hyphenated mm -hmm. because I was uh, uh, growing up in a Mexican-American family, and, <clears throat> and but my father was not Mexican-American. They divorced. So I've got a kind of almost indigenous kind of Mexican spirituality in my home growing mm. up. My father becomes a Pentecostal Christian. Oh, wow. So I, I grew up with various forms of Christianity, and then I learned that I'm Jewish, I'm already hyphenated at that right, point. Right, right. Interesting. And then I study comparative religion, and now I know all this body of knowledge from other traditions. And I did go deep in studying Hasidism because my spiritual teacher was um, of that tradition, and and one of the great teachers of the 20th century, a very famous spiritual teacher with whom I co-wrote this book. And he turned out to be very radical himself. Mm. And, and he actually asked me to begin studying another tradition, Sufism. Oh, wow. And Wait, so he asked you to start studying Sufism? That's <laughs> fascinating. Yeah, it is. And so today it's... A, weird to me but also happened very naturally now i'm the head of a, a both a sufi hasidic lineage a kind of hyphenated lineage of wow. having learned both hasidism and the sufi teachings uh, in depth <laughs> and so it's you know it's a weird <laughs> part of our world today wow that, this is just so fascinating <laughs> so a mexican now american half jewish half Christian Pentecostal now in teaching in a Buddhist university started learning about Hasidism by first focusing on Sufism. <laughs> now, I mean, wow. And the point I want to make around all that is I didn't choose any of those things. Of course you didn't. Yeah, Spirit chose you. Yeah. They chose me. And that's what's happening in the world today. I didn't mm. choose any of those things. Mm. Mm. That's fascinating. Wow. The world is creating um, kind of new combinations mm. on its own. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like chemistry. You know, the, the, you know, the chemicals are just mixing and new compounds are forming. Yeah. So it's not just the way some some people characterize what's happening with modern spirituality as kind of marketplace spirituality mm -hmm. and that is happening kind of the pick and choose thing but just as much as that's happening the world is creating the planet is it's creating its own natural new compounds mm. because because the planet loves diversity 
Mm. You love it. It's mm. only to where systems thrive. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Yeah. So <laughs> I want to ask you about, okay, the alchemical process when you actually take Sufism and Hasidism and you study both and you say, okay, there's this new consciousness that's created when you combine the two. What, how you combine it and what do you see as the alchemy when you've connected these two compounds together that may have seemed somewhat odd, bad, you know, connections? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I always tell people I can keep them separated. Yeah. <clears throat> I know the difference between them. I'm a religion professor. I can, I can turn and teach one or I can turn and teach the other um, and tell you the origin of what teaching it is. But if I'm just being myself um, and I'm just talking and you're asking me a question, even if I'm explaining something from Sufism, just being myself, it's at this point going to be influenced by the spirit of Hasidism mm. and vice versa. Mm. And so there is a third and other that's been created. The way I tend to teach Sufism has a Hasidic spirit behind it of high investment. It has that idea of the mm. burn, of Kavana. It's informing the way I teach Sufism. Mm. And... And so that's unavoidable. Yeah. Though, though intellectually, I can keep them separate. Yeah. But as a human being, no, they're integrated now. So when you integrate it in yourself and you combine these two things, what are some kind of new things that are created? Like, I understand that you're creating, you're talking about Sufism from a Hasidic lens in some way. There's a, some kind of, or, or is it, can you, can you articulate how it's shaped who you are and how you see the world. Well, I think there are elements of both that are very natural to me, and I'm very happy that I got to learn both. Um, Hasidism is a tradition that emphasizes the beauty and importance of having a broken heart. Oh. Um, they, it's said in Hasidism that only a broken heart is whole. You know? Yeah. So what is meant by that is if the heart has never been broken, then it's never sensitive to another broken heart. Mm -hmm. And that we don't know how to be there for one another until we have that kind of break. Mm -hmm. And so that only that is whole. Only that is healing for humanity mm -hmm. to have had a broken heart and to know how to approach another broken heart. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so Hasidism tends to emphasize two two interesting things the broken the broken heart and joy that is always available mm. wow that's interesting on on the sufi end the emphasis is on divine love mm. passionate love as a transformative spiritual power and the pain of that love as a transformative spiritual power now these Four ideas, the broken heart and joy and love and love's pain, have become fairly integrated in me. Um, I connect them, but not intellectually. It's just they've, they've formed a bond inside me where when I, I speak about, you know, the broken heart, I'm often thinking of that in terms of the transformative power of love and how it breaks the heart. Mm. And breaks down the ego and makes room for another. Right. So it's almost like a continuation. One continues the other and deepens the understanding of each other, right? Because if you just exactly. had one, it's like, well, that's a really interesting idea, but it's like, oh, but that also. So, all right, so I'll, I'll, I'll take a real-life example. I was just talking to my husband. We were walking around the lake, and he said, you know, I'm really feeling distressed about politics. And I know politics is not. P politics and religion are the two things you shouldn't talk about. Probably going to the bathroom is the third. And we're going to talk about all three in combination. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> so he, I, I, I would describe him as brokenhearted or we're just worried, like brokenhearted that, um, um, that some of the things um, that 
are happening to our country are changing and and he worries he worries about our mixed uh mic uh, interracial or children who are mixed race he worries about our children that are part jewish you know even though he's we don't practice he's still jewish i, I don't know how that works with judaism but even though that's just i accept that that is how it works okay even though you don't it, practice jewish, you're works. still jewish okay so he worries about being i think he i i often wonder how much the jewish kind of ancestral lines and worry worry about him so you have like asian which is not in favor right now china particularly which i'm chinese we have these mixed children you know we there's this you know we're talking to iran and you know you know with these aggressive stances we have two boys who are draft age to be drafted into a war and so there's this kind of broken heart and there's so help me put together the thing that you just talk about the beauty of having a broken heart and how it how a broken heart helps us be compassion to other people the joy which i have a hard time seeing in this scenario um the the, the pain of that love I get. So help me figure out in a real life example how you would take these two teachings from two different paths and combine them into one understanding since this is something that act, that you're really connected to. Well, all of those are just human things, right? Mm -hmm. You know, broken heartedness and uh, falling in love uh, and and experiencing pain in the world. All of that's just human. So then what is spiritual? You know, what makes those what makes those things transformative is the question. And it's really an attitude toward them. So in Hasidism, we might distinguish between the broken heart and the wounded heart. Hmm. Uh, the wounded heart is kind of like that, you know, that infected cut, hmm. you know, it's red and swollen. And every time it touch it, you know, you touch it, you flinch. Hmm. Whereas the broken heart is more like a scar, you know, it's, it's healed and yet it will always uh, be sensitive. And that's what we aim for, to move away from the reactivity of the wounded heart to an embrace of being broken hearted and the beautiful poignance of having experienced life in depth, even in pain. Uh, and how that keeps us sensitive to one another. Whereas the wounded heart is not necessarily sensitive in a positive way for another, mm. because our reactivity may cause us to lash out and hurt another. Mm. So we actually want to embrace our pain in such a way that makes us sensitive to others. Mm -hmm. And that, that takes practice. Mm. Um, you know, of course, he's right to be worried. <laughs> there are worrying things. Um, but if, if our worry only causes distraction, only causes us misery, uh, the pain of the current situation, if it only does that for us, then it may diminish our capacity now, if we're sensitive to what's going on and that catalyzes activity, then that may be positive. Mm -hmm. And so that would be the difference in, in Hasidism, the difference between what we talk about um, uh, Merirut and Atzvut. Now, um, That's a wounded heart and broken heart? Uh, these are a little different. Um, Atzvut is melancholy mm. that comes from pain and difficulty, and we get melancholy. Mm -hmm. And and the other thing that happens to us is merirut, which is a little bit of bitter, bitterness. Mm -hmm. And in this case, bitterness is seen as positive, and atzvut as not so helpful, mm. because mm. we actually need a little bit of that bitter taste to get us up, get us mm -hmm. off our asses. Mm -hmm. Because melancholy as a response to what's going on, it may be a natural response, 
and we may need to quiet and and even sleep in one day because it's so heavy. Mm -hmm. But we also need bitterness to get us up and catalyze activity mm -hmm. or the worries that are happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's it's all in the valence mm -hmm. of the emotion, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. what we do and can we make a decision around that? Mm -hmm. I'm going to embrace my pain as something beautiful. It hurts. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. But if that makes me sensitive to another heart, I'm grateful. I'm mm -hmm. grateful. Mm -hmm. Not that I even want to hold it, but I'm grateful if it helps someone. Right. Right. Interesting. See, so see that's, what I'm yes, I do. Well, in my, I don't even, I have no particular religion, but I said, you know, he wants to give a lot of money to various candidates so that we can stop the hemorrhaging of what to stop what's happening. Yeah. And I said, okay, well, if I take a meta view, this is the conversation we said, I said, if we take, if I take a meta view, what's going to happen is we'll have more Democrats and we'll have what we had before Trump came, which is a bunch of indecision and infighting also ineffective. So, and so if you give that money, are you giving out of uh, hate and wanting to stop things or love and wanting to help things? Because it seems like you're giving out of hatred, which is, and he said, no, it's that love of country. And I said, no, well, everyone loves the country or they're using that as a reason why to act in that way. But it's really, I think it is this kind of. I, I, I think it's bitterness in the positive aspect of that word, but it's also melancholy. It's both of those things. And, and uh, I don't know, um, I don't know how the, the Sufism could help, but I definitely see how the Hasidism can help in that particular <laughs> scenario. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's a tough world right now, so I think a lot of these ideas and trying to cope with the changes that have occurred in our normal reality, which to me, from my perspective, was always broken. Any, you know, it's kind of it's always it's broken. It's just I said to him, it's like what's happened is it was broken fundamentally. It's just there was a rock covering it, and now the rock is overturned, and we see all these like this life underneath it that's like worms and insects and things that we <laughs> that scare us, right? <laughs> Right, <laughs> but it was there all along. We just didn't turn over the rock because we'd rather not turn over the rock. Now we've turned over the rock. There's got to be some benefit to turning over the rock. I don't know. It's it's very hard in these days, in particular with all the politics happening today, to remain sane and and not get too meta that you're checked out. Because I yeah. thought, well, now I'm getting so meta that I'm checked out, right? Because he's like, it's the the worst thing is to be indifferent and say whatever to it because I can't. I have to let this all free fall into nothingness. And I, I mean, I didn't have an answer for him. I just said, yeah, I know. I mean, I do believe what you're saying. I just don't know when to intercede. And then you go through this whole Nazi thing. Like, I'm sure that happened with the Nazis. Like, they didn't know when to intercede. So when do you intercede? How bad does it have to get? If you can see where it's going trajectory-wise... I'm like, but I don't know that for certain. He's like, well, how certain do you need to know before you act? I mean, it's, I don't know. I don't have an answer to any of this. <laughs> These are the kind of conversations <laughs> that we're having in this family. <laughs> well, I see you don't, you, you don't, you don't, uh, you don't avoid the big three. Yeah, Tell no. <laughs> no other bathroom, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All three in one kitten caboodle. But, okay, but so. It, oh, it's interesting, though. Like, uh, are we investing in politics or are we investing in people and maybe that's the dis uh, the distinction we should if it's more politics right well we can expect a certain end well i think giving money to a certain if because in, in some ways i thought well okay if, if it really bothers that you then you would give we should give money to the people who are in pain right now you know the kids that for the families that have been deported or the kids that can't even find, like if you really are upset about what Trump is doing, then that's investing in the people by investing in the candidates that are democratic candidates. Then you're investing on a power. For, it's like a nuclear arms, right? Like I'm just going to invest in the, the arsenal of power and giving money in that particular way. Um, 
so I I don't know. I, I didn't even want to go into it with him because <laughs> he was already <laughs> upset that I'm not doing enough. So I, I don't want to go in. I said, okay, let's just give money to these places. It may be easier um, <laughs> getting into an argument. But yeah, it's, it's, the, the, it's, it's interesting because I think we're at a time when a lot of these – you can read a book, but when it comes down right down to it, when you're taking, because we were talking about taking spirituality and, 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 and having it in the mundane life where these, frankly, from a spiritual perspective, these things, these human things that I'm talking about are truly mundane, right? Because we could all get blown up and everything will be destroyed. Who cares if you're Democrat, Republican, it's we're all be dead. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? It doesn't matter at some level, but, uh. Yeah, so I don't know where, where have I led us. I've led us down a, a, a spiraling hole. Let's get us back into <laughs> your book, A Heart of Fire. All right, so we're talking about your particular path, um, and I want you know because oftentimes um, I, I don't. I, I wanted to understand some basic things like how the world was created, our souls, our spirits, and what some of the what what Hasidism says about those things because every single religion that I've talked they have a slightly different take so I wanted to hear kind of the you know who are we why are we here what's our purpose what's our spirit what's our soul that kind of uh, understanding about Hasidism as you understand it mm -hmm. well um, in some ways you know Hasidism just comes out of the Jewish tradition and and the Jewish tradition has, you know, well, well known ideas about, you know, the creation of the world and seven days and all of these, mm -hmm. these things that are incorporated into Christianity also. But uh, Hasidism being informed by the Jewish mystical tradition uh, often has a more sophisticated idea of these things. <clears throat> um, of of how uh, there was a time when time, even the word doesn't work, when there was only God, you know. But then, as my teacher used to put it, uh, God is an atheist because God doesn't have a God to worship. <laughs> so how is God ever going to have the he joy? He is radical. <laughs> how, how will God ever have the joy of discovering self? Yeah. So God has to pull the wool over God's own eyes and and create an illusion that allows for the discovery of divinity mm -hmm. so that God can have a God through making us the vehicle of that experience. You know, so these are ideas that are in the Kabbalah and in Hasidism, ideas of soul that are very sophisticated, um, but also fairly simple to understand. Um, that uh, we have at least four levels of soul. Uh, we have a level of soul that is very close to the physical body, and that's called the nephesh, which is kind of the animating soul, the, the light, you know? It's mm -hmm. the glow in our being, the spark mm -hmm. of life that is so noticeably absent when we see somebody who's passed on, and we go, that's not them. It's not. Uh, that's the, the vital animating soul, very close to the body. And then on another level, uh, we're said to have a soul that is uh, larger than that, uh, a, a greater field of awareness, soul awareness, that is our soul that is called Ruach, which is our feeling soul. Hmm. our emotive soul. Mm -hmm. So we have an emotional body too. Mm -hmm. And that emotional body knows things that um, that we don't often take ownership of. For instance, you walk into a room and there are people in it and they all have their back to you and you can feel the tension. Mm -hmm. But you're not you're not seeing any necessarily any body language or any expressions or you walk into uh, a monastery and there's a feeling of stillness there that is uncanny mm. 
So there's a part of our, our being that we don't usually own that uh, is, has a larger field of awareness um, that we participate in. Um, and yet we usually poo-poo these things, like, mm -hmm. oh, an emotional soul. Well, right. what is that field right. of awareness that is not uh, owned by our ordinary thoughts around senses? Mm -hmm. And then, um, then we have a level of soul that is uh, considered the knowing soul, the neshama. And that's what has, uh, understands archetypes and ideas, you know, and participates in a, a realm of archetypes. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that is the soul uh, that's called chaya, life. And that's our intuitive soul, the things that knows things that we can't know. Mm -hmm. uh, and they break through into consciousness mm -hmm. uh, in, in our dream life, in moments of radical intuition. And it's because at that level of soul, we're so near the divine, and the divine is all, all-encompassing, that there, in our world, there's a lots of space between me and you, wherever you're located. Mm -hmm. um, but even now, we're bridging that space by this technology. Mm -hmm. But in the divine, everything is touching. Mm. And so there's, uh, when everything is touching, uh, then there's, uh, things can be conducted. Mm -hmm. Or so mm -hmm. a radical intuitions between two seemingly disparate things is not very radical there mm -hmm. you know, that level because everything is touching mm -hmm. so that's where the intuitions come from mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. interesting so then what is spirit or god in this scenario is it all four of these is it the physical the emotional the archetypal or where does god fit into this four levels of soul? Well, God in Kabbalah, in Hasidism, is called Ein Sof. Ein Sof, Ein Sof means without limits. God is without limits, which is another way of saying God is the totality of being. You so know, it's all of it. it. So it's all, it's all of it, all and everything. Okay. And more than we could ever know, because we could never get our, our minds around what is already surrounding us. Mm -hmm. It would be the, the smaller thing trying to understand the greater. Right. So as close as we can get is to say, God is Ein Sof without limits. Ah, uh, okay. So I don't know what God is, <laughs> but it's all everything. Because it's <laughs> That's everything. That's what Ein Sof means. It means we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so why does... In, in the... Which is the only intelligent thing to say about God. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I love that. That's what the comparative religion said. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Frankly, I don't know. A lot of people have told me what it is, but who knows? All right, That's so... why I like agnostics. <laughs> <laughs> just means I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so the, the story that's so hard, I've, and I've heard the story, many religions have a very similar kind of story where God um, is, is, could, is, because God is an atheist, does not have a God to worship, it, the God it with, is within us, and it's about us trying to find that. It's like a little hide-and-seeking. Like, oh, you've been in me all along? Oh, you know, I didn't realize. So, which I find that story somewhat irritating. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, to me, it's like, well, that seems like a vengeful kind of God. Like, why would God play this game? But what's what? What's the tip? What's the Hasidic... Um, take on it i mean i'm sure god is not vengeful or is it like is it just the joy of just and then i get the oh it's just the joy of discovering yourself it's like oh brother okay <laughs> <laughs> i can kind of get there <laughs> what have you learned through your studies about this whole pulling the wool over our eyes well you know who knows about that you know that that you know that's um There's something helpful about that. There's something helpful about uh, 
revealing different notions of God, especially when we're usually taught such unsophisticated notions of God. On the other hand, what do we know about God pulling the wool over God's own eyes? Right. <laughs> this is just another story about God. Yeah, it's another story. When you really look at it, it's just another story. So what do I know and what do I experience? Now, in prayer life, in meditation, I can have experiences uh, that can be profound and suggestive about what the world and life really are. Mm -hmm. I don't know for certain that they're true. I just know that I had those experiences and they affected me profoundly. <clears throat> but often they suggest an interrelationship with all being that has a profundity to it that changes the way I relate to all being. Now, if I see myself as just, you know, this, this one-off thing, uh, this unique being, radically self-oriented, then, you know, I, I would do just what you expect. You know, I would hoard as much food for myself, hoard as much money for myself, <laughs> Uh, take up as much space as I can for myself. But when I see myself as part of a whole, part of the allness of being that is divine, and then all of us are reflections of that wholeness, that divinity, you could say, making an equivalency between wholeness and divinity, then I, there's an implied relationship uh, of it all being divine and a suggestion of healthy dependency that I want to foster and participate in. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, this is this is where the rubber meets the road with spirituality. Like, mm -hmm. what are you? What attitude and idea are you going to invest in? Mm -hmm. The one of wholeness or the one of separation? Mm -hmm. Uh, we want to honor separation. I want to honor that you're different from me and you have a different experience that I need to honor, uh, both as a woman and as a man, uh, just as a human being with a unique experience and life mm -hmm. experience. All of that is healthy. Um, but then I, I also want to just as much honor how much we share mm -hmm. and try to hold these things in a good, healthy tension. Mm -hmm. Um my teacher used to put it this way that um, uh, every religion is a vital organ of the planet. Mm. And you need them all participating in the greater body to create health for that body. Mm. Well, it's the same with each one of us. We want to say, well, if each one of us is a cell of the greater body that is, is, is God, that is all being, then I want all of the cells to be healthy and happy and whole, you know, and I want to do my job and I want you to do your job, you know, in your uniqueness. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's about the attitudes that we take just very much like with the broken heart again, mm -hmm. that's just a human experience. Mm -hmm. But what, what, sh what mind move, what consciousness move will we make that creates more wholeness? So is that why we're here? Is it, is your answer, what is your answer for why we're here? I hear her two possibilities, but I want to just ask you, why, why is it that we're here then from the uh, Kabbalist standpoint? My answer is God knows. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that makes sense to me, actually. And I can't, I mean it both as a, as a question, <laughs> and that would also be my real answer, it's like, who knows, really? Right. Maybe the question is, the important question is, what should we do? Mm -hmm. We're here. We have the experience of being here. What right. do we do now? Right. Why are we here? I don't know. Right. We well, have aside from story. being like tools for God to discover him, him or her or whatever itself. Right. I mean, that seems like a really sad way for, for reasons for us to be here yeah do i care about that yeah, really? i don't care that much about that <laughs> go buy a video game or something um but but maybe it's so so when you're saying well what's the purpose then of me being here is it to unite to harmonize to be one yeah 
Well, that, that's what I was saying. You know, we at least have to make choices. Mm -hmm. Even if even not making a choice, it's a choice. We still right. make it end up making a choice. And, and so we can use these teachings for our benefit. Uh, we can experiment with them and see if they create more room in our lives and blessing for others. But the ultimates, I, I think that's whistling in the dark. What do we really know? Um, why we're here? We just know that we are. You know, Descartes didn't have it right. He had, a, he had the, that it was the opposite. Mm -hmm. We are, therefore we think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, well, so what are we going to do with that? Yeah. You know, all the teachings in spirituality about Maya and illusion, well, that's it's true to a degree that there is a uh, an illusion to the way we uh, misperceive uh, existence. On the other hand, the one thing that we can't doubt is that we're having an experience of being alive. Mm -hmm. And so, what are we going to do with that? Right. What decisions are we going to make every day? Are they going to be for love, wholeness, inclusion? Or separation, anger, hate. Yeah, and it's it's the it thing that you were saying. It's the thing that you said that kind of got you interested in the beginning. Began, which which was to be intentional. And um, this has been so wonderful. Um, and I'm I'm sorry for the quick wrap up. I got too no, swell um, uh, taken by uh, your ideas. Um, we have a. Uh, uh, Netanel Miles Yepes here, and we're talking about a book that he co-authored, A Heart of Fire, Stories and Teachings of Early Hasidic Masters. Thank you so much for being Thanks, here. It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support. Love and blessings.